what I want to talk about in this rather short talk is kind of uncertainty relations that deal with the noise and disturbance as opposed to kind of uncertainty relations that perhaps you're more familiar with, which deal with the preparation of the state. I want to kind of use an information theoretic approach. And by that, I mean entropic definitions of noise and um, disturbance. So before I get onto that, I think I need to kind of just clarify a couple of issues first. So as soon as I start talking about uncertainty relations, what comes to head for, is normally kind of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And so a very informal way to kind of state this, I'm sure most of you are somewhat familiar with it, is that the measurement of one quantum observable introduces an irreversible disturbance into any complementary observable, so position and momentum. But it's crucial to kind of well, draw a distinction between two different notions of uncertainty relations if we want to actually talk about specific relations. So the first type is preparation uncertainty relations. And this probably corresponds to what you're, you're most familiar with, so the, the, this kind of standard uncertainty relation there. And this says something about how accurately I can prepare a state with values of position and momentum. So the fact that there's a non-trivial lower bound means that I can't prepare a state with well-defined or sufficiently well-defined position and momentum at the same time. But this doesn't say anything about measuring simultaneously both position and momentum. And of course you can't because they don't compute. And somehow this is, this is different to the notion of what Heisenberg talked about up here, where it really talks about measurement and disturbance. So it talks about measurement, whereas here is something about preparation. It's a trail. And so the, the measures here, standard deviation, I just want to kind of briefly say, um, it's also possible to use entropic measures of uncertainty for, the, for preparation. And this has given kind of rise to a whole, well, it's been quite productive in, in recent times. And so the other class of uncertainty relation are measurement uncertainty relations. And this corresponds somehow more closely to the uncertainty principle, at least in this informal uh, um, formalization. And so this really tries to clarify or capture the trade-off between the noise and disturbance of a measurement with respect to the non-commuting observable. Um, and there's many different ways that we could, we could try and formalize noise and disturbance, and it took a while to kind of come up with some decent definitions of disturbance, and this is probably why for a long time people mostly talk about preparation uncertainty. And so I've just written here in, uh, two functions N and D that are some measures of noise and disturbance. So that various measures have been proposed. And what I want to talk about is a particular entropic definition of noise and disturbance. So um, the definitions that I'm using were, um, were introduced a couple of years ago by the Skumi and, and co-authors. So I've written the definition up here. So I'll start with the noise of a measurement, but I'm going to mostly try and explain it with respect to the diagrams a bit easier to kind of understand. So it's quite an operational definition. So we consider a scenario where we, well, I should just say I consider from now on discrete observables only, okay? And I'll just for simplicity take them to be, to be non-degenerate and we'll model a measurement as a quantum instrument. So this is the kind of most general way we can model the, the, the measurement. So we consider a scenario where we prepare some eigenstates of the observable A and we prepare these randomly with a probability and we perform a measurement and we look at the outcome again. And so the intuition is that if a measurement is noiseless, then whatever, whatever kind of observable or eigenstate of repair, somehow this outcome M should be correlated precisely to this, to this eigenstate of repair, that there's no noise. On the other hand, if it is completely noisy, there should be kind of no correlation. So what I do if I let kind of big A and M be the random variables associated with the, the eigenstate prepared and the outcome, I define the noise to be the kind of conditional entropy of the output given the input. So this is quite an intuitive definition. And I just want to point out that this doesn't care at all about the outcome of the measurement. Okay? So it doesn't care about disturbance at all. But if I want to define disturbance, then I do need to take into account, obviously, the transformation that the measurement induces on the state. So in order to define disturbance, I consider kind of a, an analogous scenario where I prepare eigenstates of the operator B with, with equal probability, I perform a measurement, and I say, well, intuitively, if my measurement doesn't disturb the system at all, then if I go and measure a kind of a projective measurement of B again, then the outcome should somehow correspond to the eigenstate ahead at the beginning, because the measurement didn't disturb the state. If it does disturb it, then there should be kind of no correlation. So this leads naturally to a similar definition, but there's a small caveat, which is really disturbance should capture the completely irreversible disturbance to a state. And I can consider the case where perhaps the measurement rotates the state slightly or something like this, but it's a reversible 
disturbance and you could still get back the original kind of state with some transformation. So we allow the possibility that one performs a correction before the subsequent projected measurement of B. And so this correction can just be any CPTP map, so it's any case-preserving map, I guess, most intuitively you see it as a unit tree, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and we allow the possibility that the correction you perform depends on the outcome you had. Yeah. And so we just define the disturbance as the minimal um, conditional entry taken over all possible corrections that one can apply to this thing. So there's two different trade-offs that we can look here in terms of measuring uncertainty relation. The first is what I'm going to call a joint measurement noise, or more simply a noise-noise relation, which is how accurately does my measurement M jointly estimate both observables at the same time. So this doesn't say anything about disturbance per se. And the other is a noise disturbance trade-off, which was what the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, as I just made it, really talks about. So in the paper where these definitions were introduced, uh, a relation was showing that both the sum of the noises for, for A and B um, and the sum of noise and disturbance are both bounded by this term here. And if these observables don't commute, this is non-trivial. Yeah. So the sum non-trivial bound for all observables A and B, but in general these relations are not tight. <coughs> yeah. um, so what we'd like to do is understand this bit here. Can we give tight relations? Can we characterize the set of, of values, I'll say noise-noise values or noise-disturbance values that one can obtain for a given measurement? And so to do this we focus on qubits because obviously they're the simplest system and it's a bit easier to kind of look in more detail at. So what we're able to show, I'll look first at noise-noise relation, is that the set of obtainable values for the noise of A and B that taken over all measurements can be expressed as the convex hull of this set here. And this set here is just the set of entropies for the observables taken over all states. And this is precisely the set of um, entropic preparation uncertainty kind of values that one can obtain. So this is the link between the measurement uncertainty relation and the preparation uncertainty relation. And so we're able to characterize this set here for qubits precisely, give a precise characterization. Um, so if we look at a couple of cases, the case of orthogonal measurements A and B, so sigma Z and sigma X, for example, um, we have this relation here that can be written relatively nicely, and the set of values one can obtain is kind of this region here. And this function G here is just an inverse of a, a binary entropy function. Um, so the noise-noise uncertainty relation is just going to be the convex hull of this, which is just a simple triangle, which is nice and easy, and we get a nice linear relation there that's tight for orthogonal observables. Uh, in the more general case, for a and B being Pauli observables, I can write them as kind of the dot product of a unit vector and a vector of Pauli matrices. There's two cases that we can break this down into. In the first case, where the product is kind of greater than this down here, the region is already convex. So the entropic the preparation uncertainty region is already convex. Um, so we can use a, the entropic preparation uncertainty relations directly for, for measurement uncertainty relations. And this gives this kind of slightly ugly but tight formula here that will give a kind of bound like this that clarifies precisely the, the region. And I want to mention that it's possible to obtain any point on this, on the boundary of this region with a measurement that has two outcomes only, okay? for example, with a projective measurement. In the other case, where the, the, the product is smaller than this, the region is concave. And so this corresponds, for example, to the bigger case of orthogonal observables that I had on the previous slide. Um, if I take another value here, I get a region that looks something like this. It's a little bit difficult to see it's, it's concave, but it is. Um, and if I take the convex how I get something like this, and this is kind of thin region in here that wasn't included in the region before. Okay, so, um, I can't give you an analytic bound for this, but it's possible to kind of calculate the, the two points that kind of protrude um, numerically um, relatively easily, which can kind of give a linear bound like this which is almost but not quite tight, because it's not tight in these two small corners here. But in those corners, the region was already convex. So in fact, I can use this relation up the top here to give a tight down that looks something like that. Okay, so it's a piecewise, a piecewise uncertainty relation. It's not particularly nice, but we can completely characterize the region. Okay, so if I want to talk about noise dis um, disturbance relations, um, it's a bit more complicated because, as I said before, for the noise, I don't need to take into account the transformation on the state. For the disturbance, I need to take into account. So somehow I had to look at all possible um, instruments and all possible corrections I can apply um, in the definition of disturbance. 
so in the in a recent paper, this bound here was was conjectured, uh, which which I've drawn here. Um, but we weren't quite sure whether this is really true or not. Uh, so we were able to prove that it holds in two particular cases. So the first is if we consider measurements with only two outcomes. If we for such measurements, then then this is in fact a tight bound, and we can't do better than this. And we can saturate this with two outcome measurements. Oh, oh sorry, obviously um, we can generalize this for for non-orthogonal observables. So here, if you take note, this is just for orthogonal measurements. And the other case is just that if the state undergoes some kind of generalized Lerner's rule, is gets kind of an update function. So it's a little bit messy. I don't want to go into it, but it, it, this includes, for example, projective measurements or combinations of. So it's kind of a relatively physical, rel physically relevant set of uh, measurements. And we assume that no extra corrections are required. So we could prove that it holds in this case. Well, is it tight in general, or are these two specific cases? So what we were able to show is that it's not tight and we're able to actually do better. And we can provide a class of measurement that have three outcomes. Of course it has to because for two outcomes the bound was tight. That can find any point on this black curve here. So this extends the region at least to, to contain that area. And then to do so we also need to use non-trivial corrections to the state. So it's a very non-trivial, non-projective measurement. So the question is, well, is this bound tight, or can we go even further? Could we maybe get the linear bound that we had for a joint measurement? So we weren't able to show this analytically yet, but we can show that, well, we can try some very clever sampling of random instruments and do lots of numerical tests, and we get something that looks a bit like this. So it seems that this bound is, in fact, tight. Um, we can't give a nice relation for this, but it can be described kind of parametrically. It's this slightly ugly thing here. But the interesting thing is that this seems tight. And this region here therefore is concave, whereas for the joint measurement relations we had a convex region. So we have a kind of difference here between the noise-noise and noise-disturbance relation. So I'll kind of come to an end there, but I, the, the points I just want to try and emphasize is that for the joint measurement relations, um, optimal measurements, so by that I mean a measurement that kind of saturates the trade-off or kind of really pushes the trade-off between the, the noise of the two observables you consider it requires four outcome um, P over M's in general and gives you a convex region. And we can generalize this using results for preparation uncertainty to, to three or more observables very easily. In the case of noise disturbance, instead of four outcomes, we need three outcome measurements, but we need some kind of non trivial dynamics associated with the measurement. So in both these cases, we need kind of very well, non projective measurements to really saturate this trade off, even for qubits. And we have a nice distinction between. So of course, there's several things we can kind of go on further. Most notably, for the noise disturbance case, um, generalized to non-orthogonal measurements. Um, and another interesting question is whether there's a measurement that is optimal with respect to both the joint measurement trade-off and the noise disturbance trade-off. And it's not clear that such a measurement actually exists. And if it doesn't, then that would be interesting. Um, and then also, obviously, to try and relate this to other notions of noise and disturbance. Rather than just knowing that okay we can't have them precisely, but but we don't really know any good any but in general um, how well we can generate we can measure the noise and how much we disturb the state. So it's really just trying to understand the trade-off. Probably there are applications, but I, I top of my head I don't really. Um, do you think that these definitions you can extend it to other non-signaling uh, uh, theories? signaling theories. Um, well, I, I mean, I guess so. There's nothing to do with signaling here at all, right? So, I mean, it's, it's just a measurement. There's no two parties. There's 
one party, one measurement, right? So it's got nothing to do with it. The definition because there is some works, Justina or Minga or something, that they prove that taking a kind of disturbance definition of uh, Heisenberg principle, they can find it also in this non local. But accepting and uh, not saying that in. So, so you mean the relation between between the uh, the kind of non-trivial balanced noise and disturbance showing kind of certain... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess one could look at it, we haven't gone anywhere near, near that point yet, mm -hmm. this definition, but I don't see any reason why in principle one couldn't couldn't look in that direction. So in principle it's possible. Um, I guess so, it's not something I've thought too much about, but I don't see a reason why it should not be possible. Okay. Put it that way. Okay. Um, we should um, move on. I mean, let's thank uh, Alistair again.